Good morning, welcome to the Australian Early Finance Briefing for Thursday, the 20th of August, 2020. My name's Nick Hurley here in Melbourne, starting with Afterpay, easily the market darling of this year and probably last year as well. Its share price has surged this year. Um, it reached a high of $77 intraday yesterday and it fell back a little bit to 75. Um, certainly up a lot from where it was in at the end of March, it was just above $8 at its bottom at the sort of peak of coronavirus fears. Now, they've given guidance that their EBITDA will be almost double where they expect it to be in July. So a, a really rapid change there. Um, I guess it signifies just how rapidly growing this business is. So they had forecast back in July that the EBITDA for the financial year just ended would be between 20 and 25 million. They now think it's going to be 44. Why? Basically, the um, the transaction loss or you know the sort of the reciprocal to the recovery rate is um, dropped so they had it's had improved by 17 basis points since the last forecast and now they expect it to be um, 0.38 percent of underlying sales so it means you know then there's not many customers defaulting and they're recovering pretty much everything and um, that was one of the big concerns and that sort of if you remember back in March, that was what caused that big drop was like, oh God, if this is um, you know, a big recession, companies like Afterpay are going to be hit by surging default rates, you know, eroding any profitability. So we haven't seen that. And you know, largely that's been due to the government wage subsidy programs, both here with JobKeeper and in the US with the employment insurance programs. These um, have supported the, the the core demographic of afterpay users, which is millennials, young people in casual jobs with insecure work. Um, the concerns were that they're just going to lose out, you know, heavily with the coronavirus crisis. That didn't happen. Instead, they've got big handouts. A lot of people are getting more in government handouts than they were actually earning in their casual jobs. So that's you know given afterpay a huge amount of business, and you know meant that you know, the debts have been um, met. So going forward, that's definitely something the market needs to look out for is with these wage subsidy programs receding, being wound down, potentially you know, recession continuing, whether this, this sort of low rate of um, transaction loss will continue or whether that will surge. And you know, it has a huge profound impact, even a few basis points as we've seen, can double the profits of the business. Okay, touching on rates now, starting with what Europe's been doing and then we'll connect that to sort of the options Australia has. So you may have seen that the spread between the Australian dollar and the New Zealand dollar has surged um, to sort of re recent record highs in the last few days and a lot of analysts are stating that that's probably due to the fact that the New Zealand Reserve Bank has um, left open the possibility of negative rates whereas our uh, Philip Lowe our Reserve Bank Governor has ruled that out flatly. So it's sort of putting a lot of support under the Australian dollar. Now, looking at Europe, they've actually sort of bifurcated their rates system. So the Economist newspaper reports um, this week. So, you know, normally there's one interest rate. They sort of say that through their um, sort of their LTRO structure, they're actually able to um, split rates in two. So one of the issues with having negative rates for depositors, you know, the people that put money in the banks, they will just draw the money out. If they're paying to have their deposit in the bank, they're not going to keep it there with negative rates. So there's, there's sort of a flaw in the efficacy of, of such measures. So the Europeans have worked their way around that. So back in 2011, they, um, the ECB introduced the long-term repo operations, LTROs, to lend to the banks. And that was, you know, to help them you know, seem to work with the sovereign wealth crisis, sovereign debt crisis back in 2011. Now, they've also introduced sort of modifications to that to deal with this. So they've got VLTROs, which is very long-term. Um, versions of the structure and then um, they've called them um, TLTROs, which are targeted versions, and then HELTROs, which is pandemic emergency 
versions, go into the TLTROs. Um, it's a way to encourage banks to lend to the private sector. So the more the bank lends to households and businesses, the lower rate at which it can access the TLTRO funding from the ECB. And it's set according to a sliding scale. So the more they lend, the more negative the rates they pay. Um, so basically what it means is that they can get um, negative rates as low as minus 1% through this structure. So the banks get access to this really super cheap funding and then they are able to you know, make a profitable spread on this when they use the proceeds to make new loans. But what this does, it severs the rate to which the, you know, the deposit rates are, are, are set. So they're left at close to zero, which means savers aren't sort of, you know, running or drawing out lots of money from the banks. So contrasting the ECB to the US Fed, the, the Fed's been mostly focusing on supporting capital markets by, you know, buying lots of um, corporate debts and, and other, other securities. Now, in Europe, that hasn't been the case. So they've mostly been um, focusing on bank lending. And that's probably due to the fact, like here in Australia, a lot of corporate lending is done through banks, not on you know, corporate debt markets. By August the 7th, the ECB had lent 1.6 trillion euros um, through its lending schemes. And in June alone, the banks borrowed 1.3 trillion euros, um, meaning the ECB's balance sheet has expanded more quickly this year than the Fed's. Um, and in a speech in June, Philip Lane, the ECB's chief economist, reckoned that the measures alone um, by averting a liquidity crisis may prevent output in the Eurozone from falling by three percentage points over, over 2020 to 2022. Now, drawing this connection back to Australia, the RBA um, in their interview last week, Philip Lowe, you know, mentions that the, um, the RBA is really focused on this long-term funding facility, which is, you know, our sort of equivalent to the um, LTRO type thing in, the, in Europe. Um, so at the moment it's kept rates from now till three years at 0.25%. Um, there's talk that potentially an option to further stimulate the economy would be to extend that, although Philip Lowe's mentioned that he doesn't see that happening unless he can see rates staying at these very low levels um, beyond the three year sort of time frame. something very hard to see at this point. Um, UBS has mentioned that they they see, um, you know, the, the potential for proper QE, which is, you know, buying Commonwealth government bonds of maturities from five to ten years, and then also looking at um, what they call semis, which is the state government bonds. Um, so, you know, remove duration from the market and lower long-term yields, and narrowing these sort of the, the Fed to state um, spreads. So the RBA could potentially look at some sort of structures like what the ECB is doing and seems to be doing quite effectively um, here for Australia, where you know they could keep rates very low, even cut rates to 0.1% and still um, be able to sort of increase bank lending like Europe, you know, most of our lending is through the banks. Um, the Australian newspaper reports that you know there are some extra um, levers that can be pulled here, particularly at the fiscal level, you know, the federal government could still unleash a lot more spending to stimulate the economy. The Reserve Bank's mentioned that, you know, they need help, they can't do it all. Um, and that, yeah, that could be announced either in the October budget or, you know, ad hoc. Moving to the markets now, New York's opened um, largely flat about half an hour after open. It's S&P up seven basis points, NASDAQ's down. Um, the Russell small cap is leading the way of the three major indices there. Um, gold's back down below 2,000 US dollars, and the Australian dollar similarly placed to where it was yesterday at about 72.5 US cents. We've got company reporting um, coming up today in Australia AGL, AMP, Telstra, um, 
and Woodside Petroleum are reporting later today. And that is your early finance briefing for Thursday. Have a great day. This podcast is for investment professionals only and should not be relied upon by private investors. The podcast is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute financial advice. The values of investments can go up or down, so you may get back less than you initially invest.